Well, thanks for joining us this evening for a special look at some of the biggest social issues in America. Good evening. I'm John Jessup. And thanks for joining us in Washington. I'm Jenna Browder. The label Christian nationalism is heard often in media and political circles, but what does it really mean? Well, depending on the source, some attempts to define this term can paint it as more widespread, controversial, and ominous than ever. CBN chief political analyst David Brody brings us the story. Since Donald Trump's entry into politics began with a ride down the Trump Tower escalator almost nine years ago, the presidential candidate spoke directly to evangelical Christians, and many responded in kind. In 2024, not much has changed. We have to bring back our religion. We have to bring back Christianity in this country. Unfortunately, some who made their way inside the Capitol on January 6th echoed some of that same spirit. Let's all say a prayer. In the aftermath of those events, many news organizations took a closer look, resulting in stories such as the growing danger of Christian nationalism that's rooted in political power and even violence. Georgetown professor Paul Miller wrote the book, What's Wrong with Christian Nationalism? There's a kind of nationalism that uses Christian language and symbols and rhetoric to advance its agenda. And, 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 and it's bad. I think Christian nationalism is real. But what is being included under the umbrella term Christian nationalism? And how widespread is it really? A new Public Religion Research Institute poll shows roughly 3 in 10 Americans qualify as Christian nationalist adherents or sympathizers. But in that specific survey, the criteria cite someone as a Christian nationalist if they believe the following that the government should declare America a Christian nation, laws should be based on Christian values, that we will not have a country anymore if America moves away from our Christian foundations, being Christian is an important part of being truly American, and that God has called Christians to exercise dominion over all areas of American society. Well, that grouping could potentially include millions of Bible-believing, church-going Christians who don't view many or some of those concepts as radical at all. Russ Vogt is the president of the Center for Renewing America, an organization devoted to restoring and promoting Judeo-Christian principles. Their definition of Christian nationalism is something that obviously we reject. I mean, they're 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 putting this in in, in a bucket that is, is un-American. We're not talking about theocracy. A recent Politico article painted Vote and the group as an organization developing plans to infuse Christian nationalist ideas in a new Trump administration. Vote sees that as a scare tactic. We're a think tank. We have a policy uh, bent towards us. We have goals that are one year, five year, 25, 50 year aims. And I would put Christian nationalism and, and really the desire for Christian nationism in that bucket. Vote says it's about preserving a Judeo-Christian heritage through sound public policy decisions. I do believe in a that America has been, should be, and I hope it to be someday a Christian nation that affords religious liberty to everyone. Miller and others see it differently. They feel Christian nationalists are more about pursuing special rights for Christians and not religious liberty at all. A good litmus test here is, um, you know, do you support the same freedoms and rights for non-Christians? In one statistical litmus test, Pew Research shows that less than 1% of white evangelical Protestants actually believe Christians should get special rights. And of those who believe that the U.S. should be a Christian nation, only 24% think the federal government should advocate Christian religious values. About twice as many, 52%, believe the government should advocate for moral values that are shared by people of many faiths. Meanwhile, others have used the Christian nationalist label for those who hold the following view. They believe that our rights as Americans, as all human beings, don't come from any earthly authority. They don't come from Congress. They don't come from the Supreme Court. They come from God. While those remarks receive criticism from conservative evangelicals, Professor Miller believes it comes down to a question of where does American identity come from? Universal values or Christian ones? If you think that, we should privilege uh, the Judeo-Christian template in the public square. That's Christian nationalism. Are you out to advocate for Christian principles or Christian power? Russ Vogt says what this is truly about is politics and creating a narrative that anything labeled as Christian nationalism is dangerous, 
with the goal of keeping conservative Bible-believing Christians out of the public square and public policy. The continental divide between right and left is about God. Do you believe that God is the measure of all things, or do you believe that man is the measure of all things? And that really, if you kind of understand that fundamental, it's going to help interpret where you see people not fall not only on this debate, but on a host of, of, of public policy debates. David Brody, CBN News, Washington. All right. Thank you, David. Well, since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, abortion proponents throughout the country have been working hard trying to legalize abortion in individual states. Yeah, CBN contributing correspondent Paul Petit takes a closer look at how pro-life groups are battling the abortion effort and what they're up against in Arkansas. Decline to sign is the theme of Arkansas pro-life advocates as they fight to keep a state abortion ban in place. Arkansas is the most pro-life state in the union. The only reason that a woman could get an abortion in the state of Arkansas is for a medical emergency. The goal of these rallies, keep voters from signing to add an amendment initiative to the November ballot. The amendment aims to enshrine abortion access in the state constitution. Arkansas was one of 13 states with a trigger law, which banned abortion after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade in June. The Dobbs ruling allows states to decide. So far, abortion advocates have seen success in six states to make abortion legal again through the voting process. In 2024, there are efforts in as many as 13. The key thing to know about these uh, ballot initiatives all across the country is that they permanently change state constitutions. Your elected officials cannot go back and reverse the effects of these abortion amendments should they make it into your state constitution. 90,000 signatures must be gathered by July 5th to get the measure on the Arkansas November ballot. Local abortion advocates are confident they'll reach that number. We have momentum on our side. So Ohio, Kansas, um, Kentucky with the governor's race, Michigan, all of these states give us hope that through the direct action of people, uh, we can restore some access for abortion services in this state. This is a great amendment for people who have nuanced views or might identify as more in the middle. According to Arkansas pro-life groups, what abortion advocates are not telling people at these signature drives is how their efforts, if successful, will open the floodgates to abortion on demand at places like this and throughout Arkansas. It's an extremely deceptive amendment. They want abortion legal for any reason up to 18 weeks, which is basically 20 weeks for the baby. And then after that, it would be for, in the exception of rape, incest, or the health of the mother. And health can be defined as I'm feeling depressed. And, and the definition of health is by the abortionist. How do you think that women or any voter who believes that abortion should be allowed if the mother's life at risk how do you think they would respond if they knew the real language? If they knew that this law will make null and void all of the pro-life laws in the state of Arkansas, that means no parental consent for minors. That means no health inspections on the abortion centers. If they knew the full extent, the extreme nature of this amendment, they would be against it. In an effort to keep the measure off the ballot, Arkansas pro-life organizations, churches, legislators, and citizens are joining forces to educate and mobilize. In a matter of a week and a half, members from the Arkansas Coalition for Life, or NWA Coalition for Life, had gone to over 300 churches in the Northwest Arkansas area. And so we've taken that strategy and we've started doing it all across the state. Pro-life advocates say they'll continue the fight to ensure abortion access that voters approved in other states doesn't happen in Arkansas. It's so important that we win. It is, is a life or death situation. In Arkansas, Paul Petit, CBN News. A humanitarian crisis meets a prayer movement. How one group is ministering at the U.S. southern border. Next. Welcome back. The crisis at the U.S. southern border is the number one issue for many voters. And while lawmakers in Washington struggle to find solutions, one group of Christian women is making trips to the border to pray for migrants and Border Patrol agents as well. Charlene Aaron brings us their story. A new LifeWay study found that 91 percent of evangelicals favor immigration legislation that guarantees tighter borders. That same number also supports immigration measures that respect the God-given dignity of every person. The group Women of Welcome is doing just that, 
approaching the issue from a biblical stance, not a political one. I've been working in the pro-life movement really for pre-born lives and kids who are trapped in foster care or were awaiting forever families. And I was just challenged by a friend who worked really in the immigration space with World Relief to say, hey, does your pro-life agenda, does your pro-life biblical worldview extend to those across the border? For Women of Welcome's Bree Stensrud, who leads a community of more than 13,000 evangelical Christian women, that answer was no. A trip to the U.S.-Mexico border in 2019 changed both her mind and heart. I met with vulnerable mothers and migrant children who were also mothers themselves due to the violence that had happened to them in their countries. And they were seeking safety. They were seeking a different life. And that wasn't the narrative that I was hearing. It wasn't the narrative that um, my other friends in my conservative Christian circles were hearing either. And so it really grieved me because I thought if my girlfriends could see what I've seen on the other side of the border, they would be just as grieved too. I would want to say to another mother who was a seeking asylum that I'm so sorry. <sighs> and also that you are doing a great job and that all the little things you do for your kid, that all those little things matter. It is a sentiment Stensrud believes other Christian women would likely openly share were it not for partisan politics. It's very hard to detangle and let yourself sit back a ways to take in the full picture. Because right now, each party is being fed a certain narrative about what should be happening along the border. We should be seeing what's happening at the border as an opportunity, a gospel opportunity, an eternity kingdom possibility. That possibility turns into reality during her group's trips to the border. Opportunities to pray for migrants and Border Patrol agents abound, with officers seeking prayer for rising suicide rates among their ranks, safety concerns, and help with their families. Every officer has always accepted our prayer, and uh, we, we huddle them up in a circle, we lay our hands on them, and we thank them for showing up in some of the hardest parts of humanity mm -hmm. and trying to affirm people's dignity as they are approached by them. While Stinsroot points out their work is not politically motivated, she admits disappointment that lawmakers have failed to make progress. There are just, you know, really some detractors that are showing up and persuading people otherwise. And Americans in general, but conservative Christians, they want a solution for vulnerable people showing up at our border and vulnerable people around the globe. We want to see people work together for the flourishing of people, no matter what party you're, you're siding with on any given year. Meanwhile, as the nation grapples with the issue, the Bible calls Stensrud and others to take the lead. It doesn't mean that everybody gets into the U.S. We, we have to have thorough vetting, and the Lord is going to hold us accountable to how we treat the sojourner. You don't have to leave conviction to have compassion. And just come in and see what the Lord says in the whole arc of Scripture, and let that inform the ways that you show up politically to make a solution for thousands and thousands of people and Americans alike. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. There's the verse in 1 John 3. I think as a church, I think our call is to, is to get closer. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. A drug epidemic facing America. One father's sobering warning about fentanyl when Faith Nation returns. It's an epidemic facing America, and just one pill can kill. That's the message a grieving father wants young people to hear before they take any pills from a friend or a drug dealer. And, and many of these drugs contain lethal amounts of fentanyl. They're often disguised as pre uh, prescription medication, and they're easy to get online. CBN medical reporter Lori Johnson explains. As a track star and honors student at Ole Miss, William McGee seemed on top of the world. Oh, he was the best. You know, he was in youth group every week at church. Beginning in high school and through college, however, William treated his anxiety with prescription meds bought on the street. After rehab, it appeared William kicked his habit. But after an apparent relapse, his father found William dead from an accidental overdose. David learned his son bought and took a pill that he didn't know contained a deadly amount of fentanyl. 
I grew up wondering, trying to get a picture of the devil, thinking it was this little person in a red suit. Well, my family found out what that devil is, and it was fentanyl. He's not alone. In his book, Things Have Changed, the grieving father speaks clearly to other parents. You have to start the conversation in middle school, if not a little sooner. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid that's up to 100 times more potent than morphine. In fact, it's so powerful, only a speck, just two milligrams, can kill. These days, drug dealers often add a little fentanyl to make their products more addictive. The fake prescription pills can include Xanax, Adderall, Percocet, OxyContin, and more. Sadly, the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency found that of all the fentanyl-laced counterfeit pills they seized, 60% contained deadly amounts of the drug. That's why kids, even as young as middle school, who get their hands on these pills, have overdosed in Texas, Virginia, and elsewhere. You have to help them understand that, you know, if you take a pill, it needs to come from your doctor and your pharmacy. The National Institute on Drug Abuse has monitored illicit drug use among middle school children for more than 40 years. Current director Dr. Nora Volko calls it a good news, bad news scenario. On one hand, the number of middle schoolers doing drugs is lower than in previous years, although those using face a much greater risk of death than in the past. We have never seen uh, a, a situation where the drugs in the illicit market actually were as dangerous as what we've been observing in the past three years. And virtually all deaths are accidental. We're seeing so many people dying uh, from overdoses and from people without even knowing that they were consuming uh, fentanyl. Technology has a major impact in making today's drug trade more prevalent. Now, when kids buy so-called street drugs, they don't have to meet a dealer in some random alley. There is so many lies of the enemy from Satan who want to take away our kids and take them captive. And we do have a very hard and important role as parents right now. Today, kids typically buy drugs on their phones right under their parents' noses. But because social media connects everybody and makes it so easy, especially on apps like Snapchat, when these conversations automatically disappear, there's no, there's no record. The pills are then usually dropped off, even on the front doorstep, disguised, for instance, as a food delivery. Kids should not have full access to social media on their smartphones or even from home computers at those young ages. Brave Parenting stands by 16. Psychologists say middle school is an age where kids begin experiencing tremendous emotional changes, adding that teens who take drugs usually do so to feel something different. It might be that they take it to have some sort of high or calming effect. Kids will take it sometimes to party all night or stay up all night, you know, and be like be online when their friends are online in the middle of the night. Experts recommend parents talk to their kids about their emotions and needs, then explain that if the child wants medication, there's a right way and a wrong way to get it. So hearing about it in a way where maybe it's prescribed versus, you know, the ones where you get it not prescribed, where it's very, very dangerous. And so kids might come, you know, come at it from a point of, I need this emotionally, I'm, I'm scared to go to my parents. While kids as young as middle school may be tempted to use potentially deadly drugs, parents and others must step in, engage, and help guide them through these often tumultuous years. Look up from our own phones and engage with our children in important ways, teaching them and showing them that just because the world is this way doesn't mean we as Christians are going to engage the same way. Lori Johnson, CBN News. A Super Bowl talker targets the Olympics. How he gets us plans to spread the gospel during the Paris Olympic Games. A gospel marketing campaign that calls on Christians to love their neighbor is going global. The organization behind the Super Bowl ad campaign, He Gets Us, is taking its message to the Summer Olympics. Yeah, CBN's Brady Carter shows us how it's preparing for the world stage.
who we sponsor uh, Joe Gibbs Racing. So we have Ty Gibbs, his grandson. Uh, we we are the paint out on that car like eight times during the year. Everybody from like Taylor Lautner to um, Russell Wilson. Uh, we had Michael Pittman was working with us. He was a fifth leading receiver in terms of catches in the NFL this year. From sports stars to actors and artists looking to convey their view of Jesus. He Gets Us has become a top 100 advertiser nationwide. Most recently spent an estimated $17 million on Super Bowl ads dedicated to the gospel message of loving your neighbor. I've certainly heard people question the amount of, of spending that we have, uh, but what we're trying to do is if, if we followed the example of Jesus, both as, as Jesus followers, but also people who are skeptical about Christianity, the level of generosity that he taught, if we actually did that, would be profound. The company is moving in 2024 to expand its reach, including this summer at the Olympics in Paris. The NFL draft is coming up at the end of April. It's going to be in Detroit. That's a that's a really cool event. You'll see he gets us doing a bunch of advertising, getting its message out there. And then also during the during the Republican and Democratic national conventions, and then all the way through you know, the presidential election in November. The group's data from Super Bowl ads show these events are prime opportunities to grow its brand and message that the love of Jesus is for everyone. In the 10 days following the game, it tracked over 2 million users on its webpage, each one spending just over two minutes on the site. Inserting that message of Jesus' love into the climate that we have today, where we've got loneliness and anxiety, and significant political differences, I, I think that's a very provocative idea to suggest to the American people. And behind this message is a goal, to get people to make a choice by visiting the He Gets Us website and signing up for a Bible reading plan or joining an online small group. Brody Carter, CBN News. And that wraps up this special edition of Faith Nation. Have a great night.